Um, welcome to this great Writers Inspire at Home summer event, um, which is going to be a reading and conversation with our two authors, Salma Daba and um, Kortia Newland. Um, how this, this is going to work um, is we're going to start off with a reading by both writers, and then we're going to open up to Q&A, to discussion, to talking. Um, the theme really is writing and reading, identity, who we are in the world, what it is to, to read or to listen to literature and feel ourselves placed or not placed or um, how we engage with, with literature um, and how it, how it might illuminate our sense of ourselves in the world. Um, so anyway, uh, we're going we're gonna to have a discussion. Um, please feel free to ask lots of questions. This is very interactive. Um, after which we will close off with another reading by both writers. So let me not um, take up the stage um, too much longer. Um, I'm going to introduce our first writer today, um, who's Cortia Newland. He describes himself on his Twitter profile as a novelist, playwright, screenwriter, and literary procrastinator. He's the critically acclaimed author of many novels, from his first, The Scholar, published in 1997, to Society Within, 1999, Snakeskin, 2002, and most recently, The Gospel According to Cain, in 2013. Courtier's short stories have appeared in various anthologies, including the Time Out Book of London Short Stories, and his own collections um, as well, such as Music for the Off-Key and A Book of Blues. He's also a writer of plays, including The Far Side, Beers for Black, and Look to the Sky. So, Courtier, you're very welcome. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's really good to be here. I think it's quite an apt project for me, probably Sama too, but I think a lot of my work is to do with um, actually trying to give a voice to people who find themselves underrepresented or not represented at all. Um, this piece I'm going to read was done out of a, a project called City of Stories. Uh, I worked with Spread the Word, lit uh, literary project. Uh, and we were placed, uh, four writers were placed in residencies in different libraries. Uh, my one was Whitechapel Library. And we were meant to stay there for a week, basically, and um, gather stories. And then at the end of the week, you would write a story based on what the people have told you or what you'd found out when you walked around the area, you know, various different means. You're supposed to write a story. But I found myself so inspired by everything I heard every day that I ended up writing a story for every day that I was there. Because it's a flash fiction story, not a whole short story. So you had to write 1,000 words. So I wrote a story basically every day. I'd meet with someone or I'd go and do something. I'd come back, I'd write a story. Next day I'd meet someone else and I didn't like that. So I ended up with four stories. And uh, they chose one and they put it in the pamphlet. And, and we're judging a competition now of flash fiction stories by people who are um, running workshops in the uh, area. And uh, we're going to publish a pamphlet of those stories, including our stories, uh, my story and each of the other four writers. Uh, this story, this was a guy that I spoke to. He was just so inspiring. It was on the last day. And he told me so many things. He was a photographer in the area, Brick Lane and stuff. He'd been taking pictures of people, uh, I think, since the 80s up until now. So he had a real like, stockpile of all these things and how Brick Lane had changed over the years. And he told me two particular stories, which were, I was just like, that's it, I've got to do both of those. And so this is in two parts. I'll read one for this reading and then I'll read the other one for the last reading. And the first one's called Got to Give. Mr. Powell only loves two things, gambling and smoking. So when mum yells he's on the phone, I don't expect very much. The passageway is dark and cool. The handset lies where mum left it, sideways on the little mango wood table like a sleeping animal. Inside I groan. I'll either be sent for 20 embassy or to put a permutation on at the bookies. I've been messing with my battered Nikon for most of the morning, only I can't make it work. All I want is to be left alone in my bedroom with the dull gleam of its workings, but I'm the youngest and Mr. Powell's got no family here, so that's it as far as my parents are concerned. On the lane, Terry Jones barks loud, saying his juicy oranges are six for a pound. That never sounds right to me. I pick up the handset and don't say a thing. Tell the truth I'm pissed he hasn't asked for my brother. Hey boy, Mr. Powell says. He can hear me breathe down the line. Hi, Mr. Powell, I intone, rolling my eyes. Come now, he says. His English isn't all that, and everything he says is like an order. Come right now. All right, Mr. Powell, I'll be there in 10 minutes, I say. It's better not to argue. I'll only waste my time. 
I put on my windsheet and hang my nickel around my neck like a medallion, yelled that I'm leaving and slammed the door. Outside is proper cold, spitting rain and endless grey clouds. I should wear a warmer jacket. I nearly go back until I think it isn't worth it. Best to get it over with. Giving Terry J a wave, I'm off. Brit Lane's well busy. Families ducking into shops, women dressed completely, completely inappropriately for the nasty weather in saris and no winter coats. My bro calls them freshies. Look at them freshies, he says. Don't even know they're in the real world. Whenever he starts his crap, I ignore him. I don't like that kind of talk. Wasn't so long ago our parents were new here too. Some of them lot, Mr Powell for instance, haven't seen the West End and he's been in London from the early 60s. It's an accident some of us were born in this city and feel more at home. Nothing to get all excited about. Mr. Powell's in a right good mood. A small man with a fuzz of white stubble, eyes blue with age. Normally he frowns his way through life like something's rotting under his nose. Today he pulls me inside with a grin, pushing me into the living room. The flat's got that hot, fra hot fragrance of musty old man. An open can of Holston pills stands on the wobbly coffee table. Next to it, there's one of those big envelopes the paper round kids push through the door. Win, he says, grinning. Big win. What you want, Mr. Powell? The pools, I say too loud. The GGs. I don't know how he does it. Every day he's down at Willy Hill looking up at the screens with a betting slip scrunched in one hand. How he understands, I'll never know. Mr. Powell can't read the papers, but he still reads horses just fine. Millions, he says, lips peeled back. Jackpot, million pound. I understand, and my heart sinks. I pick up the envelope. It's brightly coloured with balloons and firework explosions and bubble lettering that says, Littlewood Jackpot, one million pounds. I turn it over. There's a free post address in Newport. It hasn't even been opened. Uh, Mr Powell, you've not won nothing. It's an advert, innit? They're saying you could win a million if you play the pools and send this off. You have to make a bet. The look on his face would make milk sour. I want to take his photo, I just don't dare. He snatches the envelope from me. Win, he says. I win. He's hesitant, not prepared to let the dream die because of some wannabe English brat. It ain't what you think, Mr Powell, it's an ad. Trust me, mate, you haven't won yet, but you might. Mr Powell won't have it. He snatches the weeping can of pills away and would snatch me too if I wasn't bigger than him by a foot and a quarter. He goes out and comes back, dragging the pig's tail phone cable taut. You call. Brother, he says. I rub my head, take it, and lift the handset to my ear. Raffi comes by minutes later, sweaty and peed off. First he's vexed with me, then I tell him. He stiffens. When he takes the envelope from Mr. Power, he does his best to keep a straight face, only he can't hide it. He tries to explain without looking at me. Even then, his grin strangles the words. I make gorilla faces behind Mr. Power's back, scratching my armpits and pushing my tongue behind my lower lip. When the old man curses in Bengali, turning around to point at me, I stop and widen my eyes, nodding so hard laughter explodes from my bro like a burst water main. That gets me to, and we both know what comes next. We're chucked out to a torrent of half-hearted slats and creative abuse. The door slams, although we hear him shout as he climbs the stairs back to his first floor flat. We breathe hard, pulling ourselves together. Don't tell dad, Raffi says, his eyes watery and red. You think I'm stupid? A counter, still grinning. We giggle quietly. He's rubbing his head, whispering, oh my days, over and over. Something about the way he's standing makes me lift the camera until he's framed, focus quickly and snap. Automatically, I wind on. We stare at each other, mouths open. It works, Raffi says. I think there's a moment of pure wonder. And it does. Thank you. translated into Arabic, Italian, and French. Salma has also published many short stories, with Grant Wasafiri and International Pen, among others, and has twice been a finalist for the Fish Short Story Prize. She regularly writes journalistic and review pieces for various outlets, from The Guardian to Electronic Intifada and GQ in India. 
She's the author of the Emerson Award nominated Radio Play The Brick, which was produced by the BBC in 2014. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. Can you hear me? Um, I'm going to read uh, in the two sec sessions for the, for the reading. I'm going to split one short story in two. So I'll leave you with a little bit of suspense in the middle. Um, it's a short story I started writing in about when I first started writing. I started out with short stories. And um, a lot of them were based in the West Bank or in Beirut or Egypt. Um, and this one came out of uh, a massacre of Palestinians in a town called Janine in 2002, which was particularly shocking for us at the time watching it. And it sort of, you know, I was living through me and writing about it was one way of processing it. I was living a very different life. I was in Bahrain. Um, I was basically a sort of corporate housewife. And um, you, you'd be witnessing or experiencing things I used to be more connected to when I had a more activist existence in my 20s when I lived in East London but and Cairo and the West Bank before that but I was now extracted from it and I was just watching it on the screen so I tried to find a story a way to experience it and to take other people into that not very pleasant I'm afraid world Anyway, it's called Last Assignment to Janine. Um, if asked when I knew the direction events were going to take, I would say I never knew. I say that to myself now. There are some directions that are not imaginable. He said our lives may be entirely restricted, but that our imaginations are free. He said free as stars. He believed orbits were necessary for freedom. Without orbits, choice would become oppressive. You can't just spin, he'd said. I'd said, watch me, he'd replied, his face circling mine up close. Imagination is not limitless. It mainly takes us to good, safe places. I didn't anticipate his departure or his loss. Even at the point in time where he grabbed my arm and the undercarriage was upon us, there was disbelief, or hope, if you prefer. Once I'd reached the edges of the camp, the realisation as to quite how screwed up everything was had come to me in an inarticulate, visceral way. It had started pounding through me. Once there, it became clear that I could go no further. I'd called him from an alleyway, and by doing so, I'd pulled him into the mess I'd thrown myself into. Before my call, he'd been safe, and he could have stayed that way. The alleyway was a dead end, about a metre wide, with iron doors on either side that were bolted from the inside at three different heights. I tried everything with those doors, but the inanimate inhabitants behind them stayed mute. If they'd responded, I wouldn't have called him. I knew he was in the area. I had ways of knowing where he was. In the seven and a half weeks before that evening, I'd started to dial his number more times than I care to admit to. But in that alleyway, I'd gone through with it. I'd called him. He answered. We spoke. After I called, the sense of having fucked up my life and now being about to do the same with him swelled so huge in me that I felt that it, the feeling of fucked up in us alone, would burst down the sides of the alleyway. The feeling, not the enemy, you understand. A logical way to think when the enemy has, for so long, been the feeling. It was a recent development to be able to see the hills from where I stood. The buildings opposite were freshly demolished, providing me with an alley-framed vista of the rocks that were absorbing the sun. A chiffony veil of dust caught on the hills, and everything about the view said, for this. For this land we fight and die forever. It flaunted its bluey-green earth, its pinky-orange sky, and the line between the two swam as the crushed colours spread between each other. Here, said the land, presenting me with yet another scandalously beautiful evening about to fall dark. It is transience that gives rise to beauty, not the object itself. The ownership of the thing is irrelevant. 
This, at least, is what I've been trying to persuade myself in recent months. But even a thought like this made me want him, for he placed views into context, turned ideas into philosophies. I wanted him, I wanted him, I wanted him always. It spiralled in my head like a snail shell of childish handwriting. I want you back, now, come back to me, and so on and so forth. It was tedious and below me, but it insisted on crawling into my ear whenever I was still. So I kept myself busy. That's what my friends told me to do when they were tired of me calling late at night. It is common, I understand, when dumped, to dwell on your possible errors and personal flaws. I tried to accept this, but it was hard. I was bombarded with self-mockery when driving, working, conducting in a conversation. Waiting to pass through the turnstile at Columbia checkpoint, I'd once, at the memory of involuntarily passing wind during the sexual act, find myself hitting myself on, the forehead in my, on my forehead in shame. Malik, the woman in front of me said, aren't you used to the weight? Although this self-abuse was a perpetual torment, it was nothing compared to the thoughts of how good it had been. The memory of his arm behind my waist pulling me down onto him, that alone could floor me for what felt like weeks. I started to shrivel as though drawn inwardly. My skin pulled tight over awkward bones. The mere sight of the words, kiss me, scrawled over a wall's political graffiti, could cause me to spend an afternoon behind my bed with my nails embedded into my scalp. I have no memory of eating during that period. I do recall picking the skin off some soaked chickpeas that my mother had left out in preparation for some maftool, but I don't remember actually consuming them. Why the hell was I in Janine on that day at that time? I would ask that too. I could answer that it was my job to go to places like that. This is the answer if I were to want to portray that the forces were greater than me. But it would not be an honest response. The truthful answer is, I had wanted that situation, its desperation, its extremity. I understood it. It spoke to me. That attack, that Janine attack, was the first of its kind the worst of its kind. Its viciousness was stunning, even to us. Now such events are more common, but at the time, that onslaught conveyed such a hurt that I felt I was alone in being able to comprehend it. Yes, yes, it was all about him. The thought, the, I thought that horror, diving into that external horror, could turn off my internal one. On the phone, I'd given him directions. I'm across the road from where the small mosque and the garage with the green tiles were, I'd said. Were, he asked. Were, I'd confirmed. Then my battery had gone. I called him. He answered. We spoke and then I stood. I even smoked. This was unorthodox for me. Hatton, the other field worker, had left his cigarettes in my bag. I'm not a standing in the alleyway kind of a smoker, it should be understood. I sit when I smoke, with a coffee or a glass of wine, and I always make sure that the ashtray is clean before I light up. I had hoped smoking might distract me from the tanks and bulldozers moaning and slipping in the valley below, but I could think only of drones and of night vision as I made a little orange star in front of my face with a cigarette of the field worker who got away. I shall stop there. And I'll continue. We're going to open it up to, to you. Um, any questions? If you also have questions for each other, please feel free. Um, if you could just put your hand up and I'll bring you a microphone. This is being recorded for our website. Um, so, yeah. Thanks very much for the readings. I have loads of questions, but I'll, I'll just I'll start low key. Um, there w I was interested that in both um, of the pieces that, that you both read, um, there was imagery of, call of calling, of, of, of phoning, um, and that worked as a kind of um, device to push the stories along and, and to, mm. to create a, I don't know, a narrative undertow. Um, and, and then I was also struck, Salma, just towards the end of your reading, you, you said, you used the, the phrase, it should be understood. You know, your narrator said that, it should be understood. Um, so my question is, um, 
and you know, any way you approach this is fine. It's really, it's a really big question. Is how you as writers appeal to the reader when you're writing. You know, when you say it should be understood, presumably your narrator is addressing someone. Um, so, yeah, when, when you're writing, when you're creating those flash fictions or, you know, that, 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 that moment in Janine, how, how, how are you reaching out to, to the reader? Do, do you have an imagined audience when you when you write? I try not to imagine an audience uh, as much, or, or if I do imagine an audience, I imagine an audience that's kind of similar to myself. I'm very interested in the idea of not writing for an outsider's gaze. So I try to write from the inside. I don't really want to particularly appeal to people actually outside of the world in a sense because I think that sometimes leads to having to act as a kind of translator and that sometimes compromises the work. Not, not always, but there's, there's a, a bit of a tradition or a history of, of compromised work in, in a sense. And some of that has produced really good work. It's not to say that the work isn't good, but for me, Sometimes it's also good to talk from an insider's perspective. And so my, my imaginary audience does tend to say, OK, this is someone who understands. I'm not going to explain. I'm not going to take the time to explain. I'm going to assume a level of, um, of understanding that's already there. And I think sometimes that gives you a bit more of a direct in in a sense, for me as a writer anyway, and it means it, it gives it a slightly different flavour. So, yeah, that's how I view it. Yeah, um, I think it's, I find it very difficult that, I mean, I started off with talking about, like, on the Palestinian issue. You, you, something happens and you feel that it's not being depicted correctly in the media. You feel there's a massive misrepresentation. If you could readjust that misrepresentation, these horrific incidences might be curtailed somehow. You have that, that, that myth, maybe. <laughs> Increasingly, I think it's becoming uh, th that sort of paradigm, which is the same when you work as a human rights worker. You're going to report on something. There's going to be a response. Pressure's going to be applied, and the situation's going to approve. And I think there is, because that was my background, that's sometimes been... Uh, a factor in the way that I write, particularly at the time I started writing that. But you might start with an, a, a motive, but it can change over the course that you're writing the piece. It can become very personal. The characters become more alive to you. She, when she says it should be understood, I was thinking of her more justifying to herself because actually it's more about her personal, what the thing that she did. She called somebody in, she used the phone, she lured somebody and how can she how can she resolve that within herself and that became a more interesting question to me than what particular facts of the Janine uh, events are conveyed to any reader this book this story went unread I mean I couldn't get it published I, it took a long time I kept redrafting it coming backwards and forwards to it and it took about 10 years it just came out a couple of months ago with an anthology but um, on, on this issue of who the reader is I was recently I I'll just quote one other writer, but which I find quite interesting is um, in, in, within my canon, which is the Arabic, people of Arab origin writing in English, there's now become a sort of, there are a couple of generations of them. And there was one writer who's really very unknown now called Soraya Antonius, who was born in Palestine. And she wrote um, about exactly this issue, but in 2000, but talking about writing about it in the 80s, so it obviously hasn't gone away, but she was saying that as Palestinians, somebody, people like m myself who've had uh, English language educations, we get this, we, we suffer from a kind of internal exile. You know, you're, you're actually being educated to a point where you're not connected with the language or the place of origin. 
Um, and she made this point about how Palestinians were trying to be like a sort of Abba Aban, who was like an Israeli delegate at the UN, who had this Oxford-educated English, and the idea that if you could speak it like that, if you could present yourself in this very sort of res you know, respectable way, that your voice would carry far more than, uh, you know, et cetera. So she said something. Um, she says, it seemed useful rather than a betrayal to become proficient in the language of the two powers most directly for the Palestine tragedy, most directly responsible for the Palestine tragedy. And all my later English, but not French writer, writing, seemed to inform the West. Today, I think this was rather a colonise reaction, implying, as it did, that Westerners were inherently godlike in impartiality and their injustice was born of misinformation. It might have been more useful had we all been obliged to do military service. Yeah. It's quite a radical statement, you know, yeah. but it does, yeah. you do sometimes think, well, what, what am I, what am I, as a writer, what, are, who, who? But then the other thing that she deals with, which I've also felt, is you're writing for your own small group. It doesn't matter how big it is or whether it's, you know, you know it, or, or a, a sort of like Palestinians who are, dispersed all over the world or Arabs who've gone through that or any kind of migrant experience. I once gave a reading in the States and somebody came up and said I just really associated with your work because I've moved from town to town within the States. So you know she was totally you know waspish American but it's so you always find different groups that you can appeal to and you can provide some sort of maybe comfort in a way through through writing or an or, or, or a known intelligence about how to deal with different situations which are very common to you, not the dominant narrative, but you, your little grouping. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that I find, yeah, maybe is, is something that happens. But each work, it's sort of where you're at. You might, you know, you might have a muse, I mean, that's possible as well. Yeah. Is that? This is the idea of the, you know, the, the post-colonial exotic, you know, um, like the Graham Hudden talks about. And, um, and that's pervasive. That's like, you know, we all have to deal with that as uh, uh, writers who are not writing, in a sense, from our place of origin, you know, in the mass, mm. depending on where that is, you, you mm. know, how far back you want to go and stuff. So there, there is that. But I, I, for me, it's just, I can get caught up in all of that. What does that mean? And I can be thinking about that. And I end up thinking about those things more than I think about the writing. And, it, and being a conduit and it coming through me. So I try not to get, even though I like reading that stuff, I try not to get too cerebral about it at the point of contact with my fingers and the keyboard, you know? Like, I've got to forget that stuff when I'm writing. And I, I, I think, um, but I do think as an artist, as, as someone who's trying to get this across, I think if you can be, obviously if you can be really, really specific, then you're hoping to be universal in the way that you were mm -hmm. talking about. And you're hoping to be able to, be able to connect mm -hmm. with people in terms of gender, in terms of class, in terms mm -hmm. of all these different other things, which are the threads that, that connect us and bind us and stuff. But my, my in, in the first instance, I do agree with that statement. I think mm. that's really true. And that's true of a lot of uh, African diaspora writing, Caribbean writing, is that there was this thing going on. I have a very strange thing because I was born here. <laughs> so so and it, I, was, I was one of the early generations, you know, I consider third generation, some people say first generation, who was born here. So it's a completely unique yeah. experience in that sense, you know. And so what other language would I adopt, mm. you know? So, so, but then there is this other kind of um, slipstream, sidestream English space, British space that I tend to inhabit. And I think if I can be true about that, then that will be okay. And that, mm. that's how I, express who I am, who we are. Yeah. Can I ask a quick follow up question? Um, I have, I've, a lot of what you said was, was really, really interesting and lots of different things to, to pick up on, but, but one is this, this association between writing and place. Because mm -hmm. you know, even though um, writing may not have, if you like, a practical function in the world, it is the case that communities over time, nations, have as were nominated or elected a writer to sort of stand for them or speak for them. I mean, you, there's the obvious connection of Shakespeare and, and, and Britain or England. Um, and I, I wondered what you would do with the question, um, in the light of, of the remarks earlier, what you would do with the question of, do you see yourself as speaking for a certain place or as sort of having to evoke a certain place 
in, in, in your work or implying a certain place. I mean, you know, your flash fiction there, Portia, was about London and, and Salma, you were talking about Janine. So you were speaking for, well, you were speaking about those places, but were you speaking for those places? Um, do you want me to? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, it's a... I think when you're writing it, you, that, that question as to whether you, you're writing um, for that place is, is not so... I mean, it probably ties into that initial thing that I was saying about having a sort of human rights approach, so maybe that did come in at some point, you know, trying to communicate out and write about a place that I felt was in more need of being depicted at the time than my Bahrain existence, for example, or, or, or either more... Um, or other worlds that I could have written about. Um, the question, I think, becomes more interesting later on when you actually start getting a public, you get a little bit of a public persona as a writer. What platforms will you sit on? Will you not sit on? What will you comment on? How much is it within your remit or not within your remit? And because I have, you know, my, even my legal work is a lot of it's on Palestine, it's like, I, I sometimes get to being quite, quite complex as to the decisions that you'll take about, I think I'm qualified to speak on this subject as, as a lawyer, but not, I won't speak on a, perhaps an activist front on this issue, which I just don't know enough about. I mean, some writers have a much more embracing, you know, they want to be the, the spokesperson. And it's very easy for that to happen in this country where there are so few people from particular parts of the world who have you know, so few seem to be articulate voices that writers are used often to be, you know, uh, explainers out of, of places. Now, because I, for, for various reasons, I cannot be as connected to Palestine as I would like to be, I feel that it's often, it's not my place to be talking about the current situation there. There are much better academics in universities than me as a writer. There are people who are more Palestinian than I am in terms of having greater connections. So then I sort of step down or step out or represent, get, push somebody else forward. I mean, that's, that's a different question, but how, how I, you know, I don't see that, I don't think many Palestinians would, from the West Bank and, and Gaza would probably see me as a being a very Palestinian writer. I write in English, you know, they, will, they might want to dissociate me. They might think I'm too privileged, I don't know. But, or my mother's English. There might be, a, there are whole different reasons why they might not want me to be representative of them. And I mean, I have, you have to be sensitive to that. And I think it's made me perhaps over-research when I do write on that subject, just out of sensitivity for not seeing me like I'm, you know, taking over other people's stories or, mm. or um, holding myself out as something that I'm perhaps not, yeah. not enough. Yeah, no, I totally agree with you. Because um, pl place is really strong to me as a writer. I've always written about a particular place, a particular area of London, which is West London. Up until now, um, I, I lived in West London uh, until I was 30 and I started writing when I was 23 so, so my, all of my beginning stuff was just about that very small like Shepherd's Bush Lab Grove place and I lived there my whole life so, so that's what I knew that was my stomping grounds that mm. was my patch and stuff and then I moved out at 30 I moved to Brixton and then I moved to East London for a long time when I was in Brixton I was still writing about West London you know um, and I was known for that and then just lately it started to shift and just lately I've been like, okay, I'm going to start writing about places I've been to when I've travelled abroad and stuff. I'm going to write about East London. I've set a few uh, stories in, in East London now and, and things have started to move. But what's interesting about that is, yes, you get published and yes, you get known for it. And even though I'm from there, I was born there and I'm very much a part of it. I feel very much a part of that community. It is my one true community. Even though I'm in East London, I'm in Brixton, and I, I like it and I get along. That's the place. People are like, I even act differently when they see me there because it's just, <laughs> I've grown up around there. Um, you still get disconnected by your privilege. Yeah. Uh, and my privilege is that I was published. And, and so I became slightly different from everybody else who was still there. Then I became even more privileged, although you could question that, by moving to Forest Gate, you know, and, and not being part of that community. So, then Grenfell happens, right? I've written about West London, 
all the time. That community, those people, write about that working class experience and Grenfell happens. And then I feel a little bit like exactly what you mm. said. I can't speak on behalf of those people mm. in that way because I'm 10 years now disconnected from that. I haven't lived there, haven't been around. Things have changed so fast that I don't know certain people. I went to Ackland Village, which is where they were doing some of the collections and stories and stuff, because I know the people there. So I walk in and I know a number of the people who are stacking the boxes and organising it all. And the guy who's running the whole place, I grew up with him. He played drums at my wedding. I walked in and there's a kid. He's about 18 or 19. And he's looking at me like this. And he's watching me walk up and down. And I suddenly thought, yeah. So I left 10 years ago. You would have been about, I don't know, maybe like six, seven, eight, nine at the time. You don't know me. To you, I'm not part of the community. It's only when he saw me talking to certain people, then he was like, oh, OK, OK, he knows people. He knows this person. OK, I'll leave. And he stopped looking at me like that. So there was that. <laughs> and it was like that, because it's got really quite, you know, there's lots of stuff going on polit politics-wise with that space and the storage and the fact that people have claimed that space and stuff. And he was looking at me. I was looking for the toilet, but he was looking at me like, what is this guy doing, walking up and down, looking like he wants something? You know what I mean? I don't know you. <laughs> And I'm from the community, so there's that, that, that connect, disconnect. So um, I've been very careful with Grenfell mm. not to be talking to people. People have asked me to do articles, they've asked me to do this, that and other, and I've been very much, no, you need to talk to this person. No, that person should go on the radio and stuff. Um, I, I suppose that I haven't really got a point to that. It's just that that's, that's the experience, in a sense, and, and you tend to, as much as you are, you, it's very dangerous, I suppose, what I'm trying to say, to start thinking that I am speaking for a community, mm. I'm being a spokesperson for a community in that way. And part of that is the publishing experience. And mm. you have to, you do, I'm agreeing in a sense, you do have to accept that and you have to play your role a little bit and, and know when, when it is to step back. Mm. But I've never, I've also, on top of that, never really felt like I wanted to be the one saying, hey, I'm the West, I'm the right, and it's all about me, and I know, because there's so many versions of, and there's so many different communities, and it's very difficult to speak with one voice about that place. Yeah, I, I agree with that, and it's quite interesting how our experiences, I mean, our life experiences of, you, you're, you're very grounded, you know, relatively, you're very London, yeah. and I've had yeah. such a... You know, I've moved so many times. Mm. It's like quite, I've always hungered to have that connection to a particular environment. You know, mm. even if it was 10 years ago, I have never really had that. I've always been sort of floating on the surfaces of places, I feel. But the, I think in terms of this issue of like how people feel about you speaking out for them, I think I was overly sensitive to it. I actually think that when I went to Gaza in 2012 with Palfest, I didn't feel that there was a, a resentment. I didn't feel that there was suspicion. I think, felt that people were actually very grateful, you know, that, was th that back Gaza was being put on a literary map. And I think that, um, I think I'd been uh, perhaps overly, overly holding myself back from perhaps being more proactive. But, but then perhaps people were grateful because they saw the stance that you took. Yeah, and perhaps maybe. if you'd taken a different stance, like a bit more like, so. eh, then, then, then maybe, that was Maybe because I'm just not very successful. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's that. Um, I think people re respond because of the way that you carry yourself, and I've seen that again from the Grenfell thing. Certain people who um, push themselves into the limelight, resentment very quickly mm. is built. And they can be from the area of born and bred and do that. And people will still be like, what, what are you trying to get out of it? And then other people who played more of a back role, people say, OK, yeah, I like the way that you've carried yourself when you mm. do these things. And that's very important, I think. Um, yeah, I found very interesting what both of you said about being part of a community or also being questioned for your position as an author. And I was wondering if there's maybe a kind of clash between authors on the one hand and then the publishing industry and the publishing industry trying to find spokespeople or trying to find authors that they can, you know, that they can form as speaking in a certain way or that represent certain things. Yeah. Well, I, th can I, um, I think on that, it's really interesting that because I do think, and I, I think 
there's a slight movement away from it, but I do, when I'm feeling hypercritical and uh, annoyed with publishing, you do feel sometimes that you're being, that the interest in your writing, if it's about a, a world, you know, one of our, the worlds that we write about, it's kind of to be given, that you're meant to be giving an, a sort of authentic voice account, you know, you're meant to be, it's like being um, some kind of journalistic stringer, you know, but, I mean, f like, but with, you know, in a kind of more um, aesthetically pleasing way, that there wouldn't be a reason for somebody to read your book to learn something about themselves. They're trying to learn about, um, you know, something new, a new geography, a new situation. And to an extent, you have to kind of, it's very difficult, particularly if it's your first book, it's so difficult to get published. It's very quite difficult to push back on that and say, I'm not being positioned like this and that, and you know, to, um, to, to present your book differently or in a more nuanced way, because they have certain buzzwords that they, they know work and will work with the bookseller and will work on other levels. Mm -hmm. So, um, a bit, but not, I mean, I think there's a growing sensitivity and a grow, and what's also very, uh, in the last couple of years, I've been several writers with um, non sort of Anglo Saxon names who've written novels which have been very successful, which have nothing to do with their place of origin, you know, and that's quite, and they're sort of breaking through as writers who can deal with any subject matter, but it still is mm -hmm. a little bit tougher than if you're, you're dealing with some form of community. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I think from my perspective, um, and talking about you know African British writing or, or Black British writing, whatever you want to call it, I think I think it is quite limited actually. I think mm. um, we we haven't managed to find that scope and range which speaks to the fluidity of who we are um, as a community. And so uh, I was very much aware when I was first published that I would have to write a certain type of story in order to get published and. What was lucky at that time was that I knew how to do that. I'd been brought up in that environment. So I was writing about council estates, I was writing about working class living, I was writing about kids that talk slang and do all sorts of criminal acts. I knew about that. So <laughs> I'd grown up in that environment. So when I saw that there were books being published like that, I, I was like a bit like, okay, well, finally, people would be interested in that type of story. So I told that type of story, I got published. Um, then when I started trying to be like, okay, well now I want to talk about the wider community, I want to talk about bigger things, I want to say that not everybody goes through that experience, uh, it was more difficult to uh, be published and stuff. And because I wasn't talking so much about identity or hybridity or any of those things, then or, or my, my stuff is less about a struggle mm. with identity because that's not my experience. My experience is being, like you say, part of a very strong community, so I'd always come from that perspective, a uh, perspective of knowing who you are really, and that was less palatable. But also, I w I'm really interested in um, these different types of experiences, so mixing up genres, uh, writing speculative fiction, still from a working class perspective, uh, writing about people who just live their lives and don't, you know, go through all of these struggles, you know, um, just more writing about just everyday experience. That, I did notice that that became less palatable. And now we're in a particular time where, I think it was, I think it was 2015 or 2016, I think it was 2015, where they realised that uh, there had only been one black British male writer published in the entire year, you know, uh, just one, and uh, a debut, sorry, writer, which was, um, Really, really alarming, you know. We were like, like wow, that's just that. I mean, that's a, an actual fact. No one could dispute that. And so, yeah, that's how narrow. And he was writing about the stuff that I've been writing about 20 years ago. He was writing about, you know, um, um, and it's called Mama Can't Raise No Man, and it's about his real life experiences mm -hmm. of coming from a street background and criminality and stuff, and him getting himself out of that life. It was the same narrative I've been saying before. So, yeah, very few like roots. Um, I guess this is slightly a follow-up question to that. Uh, almost is um, how do you, how do you how does it change your approach uh, when for um, for Courtier when you've got uh, almost got given a brief? You know the publishers actually said we've got this 
this work and there's going to be this this collection and you're almost given a space you're you know you're you're um you you spend the, the the week in the library which is also an interesting space in itself because it it does kind of mediate that kind of private experience of reading with being in a very kind of public space as well how did having that brief and kind of uh, change if if it did your approach and also maybe even how your responsibility to the people's stories that you tell. Sure, that's a good question. Um, it, it it didn't. I don't think it changed my approach and my responsibility because I always have that sense of responsibility anyway. I've always been a little bit worried about how I depict people and, and trying to make sure that I depict people in the right way. So. Uh, I always come, I, I step forwards in my writing with a real sense of trepidation, you know what I mean, about that, and I'm very careful. And um, so, so it didn't change my approach. It, 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 I, I tell you what, I think if it did, it made me a slightly more guarded because this was uncharted territory. This was East London, you know, this was a different community. This was the Bengali community. And uh, I, I think I was, I was slightly warier and I was slightly more cautious. So, you know, I just, Mm. took my time a little bit more but I think the process and everything was was very pretty much the same you know and and like I said I try not to overthink things as well I try not to like be like okay are you going to stop yourself from doing things so even even Mr Powell like I kind of like you know I was like okay I've got to be careful with him you know he's he can become a, he's a bit precarious as a character you know he become he could become a, a parody you know very easily if I'm not careful with him so I tried to um, just uh, try and treat him with respect, even though I was, you know, having a bit of a, a, a laugh at him at the same time, uh, or with him, I should say. But I think, um, no, I, I think it was, for the most part, I just did what I know I can do. And this is the thing, I think by, by this stage of my career, I feel like I'm quite grounded in that the process works. I can do this. I've done this type of thing lots of times before, and even when I wrote my first uh, novel, that's what I was doing. I was going into the community and, and um, re-examining it. Um, interestingly enough, given what I said earlier, from a slightly outsider's perspective, so even when I'm doing the research and stuff, even when I was writing about the council estates and all that stuff, I didn't act like I knew everything. I had to go and re-research everyone, interview people, talk to people, try and get their stories and stuff, so I still acted like there was a lot that I don't know. And I think as a writer, mm. if you come from that position, like, this is all the stuff I don't know, or even I know nothing, you know, and you just really look at it, then that makes your fiction really fresh. So I, I don't know, it's like sometimes it's like I said that thing about uh, I don't write with an outsider's perspective, but then when I'm doing the research and stuff, I actually feel like I'm trying to feel like I'm an outsider in a sense. And then, interestingly enough, you become an outsider by, by that approach, you become an observer more than an actual active person who's participating in all the stuff that's going on. Yeah. I don't know if that makes any sense. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's confusing <laughs> to us too, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I just wanted to know, what's your motive to write? Do you write to start a certain movement or do you just write for the love of writing? Um, I think for the love of writing, really, it has to be because um, it's it can be feel like a bit of a thankless task. I mean, it's become, <laughs> it's... Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's, it really has to be something that excites me now. I mean, it takes so long for me to get something to a point where I'm happy with it. And I think if I have a really good day writing, there's nothing like it. If I can create a world that interests me and has gone off in little directions that I didn't expect when I started writing it, and that the thing I want to read by the time I go to bed is the thing that I read, started writing that day then I'm really, I love that. Um, uh, and I love that a lot more than I do the rest of the job, which is a lot of, uh, a lot of sort of trying to get it placed and um, build up a, you know, a, a following of some kind. You know, I think that it's a shame that, um, 
but some but with any work i think it's it do, you don't have to have a huge audience to it if a work has made you feel very satisfied with it and if you can give it one even just one other person who it can resonate with in a fresh way that is also really significant so i think it's finding a, a true resonance with yourself and, and with you know one one reader whoever they may be wherever they're from wherever they read it it's just that you know that connection and i think also what what i love about writing which is where i think that this whole discussion however well meaning meaning is about um, cultural appropriation you know the taking of stories and that some things are off bounds I find that a real shame because I think one of the things I love about writing is the fact that I can hi inhibit anybody's life if I can feel them intensely enough enough whatever gender whatever age whatever background if I'm if I'm close enough, and by getting close enough, it might mean that you can't do it very well unless you read huge amounts and submerge yourself in a place and have a lot of friends from that place or whatever it is to cross that boundary so that you can write that story in, in, in a compelling way. But I, I, I would find it very sad if we could only write about people who are very close to us. And particularly because I'm from a mixed background and I've moved so many times, I just don't know quite where my group would be. <laughs> what yeah. do you think of that? that I mean, because there's been the recent debate which mm. has got quite heated over Brisbane and... Yeah, I'm the Brisbane sure thing. That. I mean, I think that was a very uh, insensitive way yeah, yeah, to yeah, go totally about that. that conversation. Totally, yeah, That's yeah, what I yeah, think. Yeah. I think no, totally. I, and I think it, it also, it came, it came, you know, the, Lionel Shriver did this talk in, at Brisbane Writers Festival where she kind of said, She was oh, very man, mocking. Of very mocking whole. of people being upset about cultural appropriation. I think what that did was negate that actual privilege that definitely does exist in terms of telling certain stories. Yeah. But also, it didn't take into account that, I don't know, I mean, I'd, I've heard of one person who's really, really against people writing stories about cultures that are not their own. Um, but I've never actually met those people because yeah. I think most writers are of the mind that if you do the research mm -hmm. and you do it well and you're open to criticism as you would be with any other character mm -hmm. you write, then, then it's going to be a good thing, right? So no mm -hmm. one's actually saying that you can't write about other cultures, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, some of my favourite writers, um, Richard Price, who wrote the book Clockers, you know, is that like... like a white New Yorker who's writing about you know black kids in you know, the, the, the projects in America mm. and, and very successfully. Um, you know I love his work. I think he's brilliant. I mean I could go and I can name you know, loads of examples and stuff. So when it's done well mm. and it's done where you take into consideration the amount of research you're going to have to do to inhabit that space, which is what you were just talking mm. about, then it's fine. You know, um, but I think Lionel Shriver in that conversation was saying something slightly different mm. you know and um and also it has to go both ways as well i think i think then if you want to be able to do that then we should be able to do that too mm. so um i think she handled it badly but a lot yeah. of what she said i i, I mean <laughs> yeah no anyway i agree with you on that but i think where where it goes wrong sometimes is that if you when the so if you have when you have a white writer dealing with a subject and a black writer dealing with a subject and it, it's going to be when the publishing industry or the marketing or whatever is going to make sure that the, the writer from a white background is just, just go, it's going to sell better, it's going to be marketed better, it's going to be put forward for prizes. I think then, but it's not really the writer's themselves necessarily no, their the fault, fault you know but yeah. so it, it's a shame if you clamp down on what they're able to deal with because it's hard enough to write as it is <laughs> mm. rather than mm. deal with the whole the the, the other mm. yeah. um the yeah, other reasons why it might not get ahead but i'm interested in this idea of clamping down and, and where that would come come from and who's doing it because we certainly don't have the power no. to clamp down on anyone so it's interesting that the, you know the, the, the fingers being pointed and you guys are clamping down on us like who how where it's like i don't know anyone I who's think doing it's in that the states more i think it's more but it, that wouldn't be coming from the people of color who because like, we don't have any kind of power control yeah. in the States or in the UK or anywhere, you know, that, that's coming from something else. And maybe it's more to do with a perception and maybe if there was a dialogue about this, then we could maybe clear up 
that misconception mm. that that's actually uh, happening, I think, or that's even what people want. Uh, I just, like I said, I haven't met anyone who thinks that that's a, a valid thing as a writer to be advocating. You know, in fact, people advocate the complete opposite when I've had conversations yeah. with people, particularly writers of colour. They're like, I don't believe in censorship of any kind because that yeah. would curtail my right to be able to sure. write things. So, no, even if we don't like it, even if it's, you know, what's his name, Milo. You know what I mean? I, I don't, I, like, as much as I find you know, his views are boring, I wouldn't say that that book shouldn't be published. It's just like, okay, so what are you doing to correct the balance then? Okay, who else are you publishing that might have an alternate point of view? And then that, mm. then things would be a bit more fair. It's when, it's when it's like this, and we're saying, hey, it's like, it's democracy, it's freedom of speech, and actually, no, you're privileging one, one version of freedom of speech over another. Um, this is mostly for Kortia. I wondered if um, you could say something about um, how sort of London has shaped your kind of literary aesthetic. So kind of apart from sort of the th themes and subjects, but also whether you think London has shaped your wa writing in a kind of formal sense in any kind of way. And the reason why I'm asking that question is because I've lo been looking quite um, a lot into the early writing of the Caribbean artist movement. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the early meetings was about, you know, what is a West Indian aesthetic? And therefore I'm wondering, as like a first generation or black British writer or African diaspora writer, if you're sort of thought about sort of, yeah, how, yeah, kind of what, what, what the London aesthetic is or what a kind of first generation black British aesthetic might be. Wow. <laughs> That's a very interesting mm. and difficult question. Mm. Yeah, I did. I started off by examining those guys as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I was looking at um, Beryl Gilroy and Sam Selvon and Kamal Braithwaite and, you know, uh, um, Andrew Sorkey, who's a, a favourite of mine, uh, and Steve Lamin, you know, all those guys who were doing that stuff. Um, I started off by trying to write a kind of Windrush novel and I was researching it for a while. That was my first novel that I was working on. And then I encountered Lonely Londoners. Uh, which is set in my area where I grew up in and what I was writing about and I read Lonely Londoners and I was like, oh, well, I can't do this now. I'm trying to do that like in the mid 90s and he was actually there and this is the story that my granddad's telling me and all these things that he said happened. This guy's already written it. He's done it. <laughs> so that was like, you know, back to the drawing board, uh, you know, seven chapters in, I had to scrap the whole novel. But then I started thinking to myself, so, okay, what could I write? What could I talk about? And that's how I came about the scholar. I was like, but I know this, I know all this stuff, and I know this way of talking, and I know that. And it's almost like it is the direct descendant of Lonely Londoners. It's, this is where we are now. This is the, the, the grandchildren of those guys who came over. This is what their Britain looks like. This is what their Britishness looks like. So that's what I was, I was, I was doing. Um, but I, I was really hesitant to think about it in terms of creating an aesthetic for all the reasons I spoke about earlier about not wanting to be a spokesperson and stuff. And there's going to be so many different ways. So I believe that someone like, say, Helen Oyeyemi, although her perspective is completely different from mine, is completely valid as well. You know, it has to be, right? So if we talk about a canon and we talk about an aesthetic and stuff, it has to be a plural one. It has to go in so many different directions. And, and, and for everyone that's there in London, you know, say, you know, eight million people or something like that, there's going to be that many different aesthetics. And that's, and only then, when we've reached that point, can we then zoom out maybe and look at it as a whole and say, okay, so this is the kind of things we're doing. But I think one of the unfortunate things about what we were just talking about is that you never get to that point because everything's dictated by a quite singular way of seeing the world and a, a singular voice and stuff like that. And um, we don't get to read those multiple narratives. So that's another reason why I find I, I get so upset and passionate about it, because I want to see that. I want to be able to read this thing and say, hey, this is what we're doing. These are the directions that we're going in. This is the tradition that we have and we come from. And, it, it, and it's interesting, I don't know, I'm just rambling a little bit, because, but it's interesting just because as much as I feel that I have that Caribbean aesthetic, um, it's, 
it, it, the, the, there is that London aesthetic as well. There is that London, very working class aesthetic that I also feel a part of. And, and I feel like I owe a lot to that, you know? It's like, you know, the Irving Welsh's. I owe a lot to that, you know? Like, I believe that my book couldn't have been published if Irving hadn't gone before me and done what he did in terms of just the class thing, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And being on housing states, even if it was all the way in Edinburgh. So mm -hmm. it, there's also then, yeah, these different kind of multiple aesthetics in that sense as well. It's, it's, um, it's really vast. And your question is really vast, and I, I can never answer it and give it completely just because it's so big. But uh, I mean, where I see myself is is kind of like at this point in time, is building something like I'm burrowing somewhere, but not quite sure where it's going to end up, and I have to be open to all forms of influence and, and and all forms of directions. You know, I can't. So I've just got to try stuff out and experiment. And one thing that's really good is that those guys, I'm sorry this is a bit long, but those guys who went before, they were very clearly defined. And what that tells me then by that clear definition is what I don't have to do because they've already mm -hmm. done it for me. I don't have to say those things, you know. My, I, my duty is to say something new to them. They would want me to say something new. I know the, the few people who I managed to meet, like Kamal and people like that, they're very much like just go off and do your thing. You know, yeah, just, just you know, go and be, you know, that's all, that's, that would be great for us. Yeah. So that's really freeing, you know, as a writer. Do you have something similar, like um, aesthetic in that way that you draw from? Um, well, I think it would probably, I mean, I've got, why I got so excited about finding this article sort of about Arabs who write in English. And I think also for me, when I first, in the late 90s, I found a book written by Hanan al-Sheikh, a paperback, which was a novel, and it was set in Kuwait, which is where I'd grown up. And if anywhere is completely off the literary map at the time, it was Kuwait. I mean, I was constantly having to explain this place where I lived. Um, and, it, and it just, to me, it, it, there's a sort of, there are a growing number of writers who live between languages that I think I hook on to. Um, but no, not, I mean, I think I've just, I don't feel that I belong to a, um, a particular aesthetic. I don't see it really in that way. But it's strange because the Caribbean experience is of that experience. Yeah. It is actually, it's like a kind of formalization in a sense of that experience because of the whole, um, you know, slavery, mm. you know, history and stuff. It meant that that was, you know, maybe hundreds of years ago, that was enforced on people, you know? So uh, uh, it's a strange one. And I think that you, what you're talking about mirrors, mm. I can, I can relate well, to that so much. It's the discon, yeah, yeah, people who are kind of di neither of one place nor another, or, you know, fully. Yeah. I think that those, that, that kind of writing. Um, and I think I was very curious and I found it very hard to find writing about the modern Middle East, like, mm contemporary world, like people not who were there, who were just living urban lives which weren't that different from Europe, you know, like the, rather than concentrating on the difference, the, the similarity in terms of setup, mm -hmm. the non-exotic, uh, but having huge strains on them in terms of, I don't know, their, the, the, the way that their families were spread apart, the number of languages they were dealing with, the uh, issues to do with, I don't know, visas or war or conflict or, you know, just that you're normalised, but the situation is, it's, it was hinting at some of the issues that had come up in my life. I mean, like, you know, like Kuwait being invaded or my father being kicked out of Kuwait, uh, out of Palestine and, um, and, and different sort of upheavals that it was commonplace for my family, you know. Um, yeah, I think that's, and how, how you normalize it. And you, you know, go on and you adapt and you find a new place. And, and then I think, um, and, and some of the sort of just mental fallout from that as well really interests me. Yeah, but I'm just I gonna say. I, that, 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 yeah. That's great. Um, I'm, I'm so sorry to kind of call yeah. this discussion to an end because I'm sure there could be lots more questions. In fact, I see half a question there. <laughs> um, but I think maybe we should, we should move on to Alicia's question. Are you desperate? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to tell me it's a really big question. 
just as you were talking, both of you, just in the last few moments, I, w I kept thinking of that, um, that essay that Salman Rushdie wrote a long time ago now um, about imaginary homelands and how writing is a way of, of, of bringing the shards of memory back together. Actually, I think Walcott actually also has a, when he talks about the broken heirloom. So, yeah, just, uh, just in closing, a, a question about whether writing puts your homeland or your memory or your community back together. It, it, it might be that actually what you've yeah. been saying is that you're onto another thing entirely, but mm. yeah, that's there's putting a question. it very beautifully. I'll, I'll go with that. <laughs> 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 Better than I can do. Um, I, 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 I just feel like, like what, what you're saying and what you're saying actually gives us this kind of like uh, route or pathway to something that hasn't yet been defined. And uh, it's less about putting something back together as it is about creating something like really new. And what's interesting for me is this that, that, that I have all these, like I'm never stuck for a story. I'm never stuck, you know, like because of this experience, it just means I'm always thinking there's all this stuff that hasn't been covered mm -hmm. yet. There's all these people that are not spoken about yet. And it just makes it a really like enriching time to, to exist in, you know, mm -hmm. and to write about. Great note to, to end the discussion on. Um, so, shall we have one last? Sure. So, yeah, uh, this is, uh, like I said, a continuation of the relationship between these three guys uh, Mr. Powell and the two boys that he knows from around the Brick Lane area. And it's called, uh, sorry, it's called Mr. Powell's Retreat. Many years later, Mr. Powell sits on the curb of Whitechapel Road, his legs wide open and his hands limp between them, staring into the gutter. Raffi sees him first. He pulls at my shoulder. I hardly recognise him. Then I do. We go over, crouching beside him. He's muttering or singing something I can't hear. His trainers are worn and black, split at the front like an open mouth. His suit, which was always neat, is torn at the left sleeve and his white shirt is black with grime billowing in the breeze of passing traffic. We speak to him and each other in Bengali. I'm not sure he recognises us anymore as there's nothing in his eyes, but he talks back in return saying something about retreating. We don't know what he means by that. Rafi suggests we lift him. He's the oldest and I'm used to doing what he says, so I shrug and say, sure. We tell him what we're about to do and make good on our promise. He's light, all bones and cotton. It feels as though he hasn't had a good meal for months. He leans on us all the way to his home, gives us the keys and we let him in. Going upstairs, he stops and stiffens, pulling against us as if he wants to go back on the street. We resist him and it's a tug of war until Raffi opens his flat. The stink's terrible. Old rubbish, mouldy food, unwashed old man. Mr. Powell gives up then, it's almost like the smell sedates him. We lift him the rest of the way and deposit him on the sofa. Raffi turns on the spot looking at the wall. Jesus, he says, which is unusual for my brother. He doesn't take deities' names in vain, even when they're not ours. I'm keeping an eye on Mr. Pal in case he makes another break for it, so at first I don't see where he's looking. When Raffi doesn't speak again, I clock it as the second weird thing he's done in, in as many minutes. I check on him too and see why. Mr. Pal didn't bring much from Bangladesh, but the thing I always remember is the photo of his mum hanging above the electric fireplace. It's pretty big, and it was actually me who helped him to frame it when we found the print amongst his things, just, just after I really got into photography myself. It's one of those old sepia tinting ones and must have cost a bomber at the time. She's sitting on an unseen chair, looking into camera, wearing a sari with her head covered, and it must have been taken when he was young because I have to say, she looks beautiful. I don't know if it's the color enhancement or the way she always was, because her eyes are bright hazel and a really nice shape. They don't look alike at all, apart from something in the twist of her mouth. But Mr. Powell's smiling. But Mrs. Powell's smiling. And Mr. Powell hardly does that type of thing. That's how it used to look anyway. Has done for years. Only now, half of the photo, and Mrs. Powell with it, have faded into some inky black kind of fog that obscures the left side of her face and everything else on that side with it. Mr. Powell rocks on the sofa. Retreating, he says, 
pointing at his mum. All retreating. Rafi asks what happened, but that's all Mr Powell says. Retreating. Retreating. His English has got better since we were kids, so it's a shame to see him regress to the Mr Powell we knew way back when. Rafi makes that whistling, whistle noise you use to say someone's cuckoo. I frown at him, that isn't fair. I get up to take a closer look at the photo, and there's smaller ones lying in the mantle. These landscape colour snapshots like you used to get from the pharmacy. Old school. Grinning kids, an upright family, a young girl caught mid-cartwheel, kicking village dust. Except, each one's obscured by that fogged fade in blackness, like Polaroids in reverse. Instead of developing, these pictures are dissolving, retracting into a misty, unreadable past. Retreating, Mr Powell says, seeing my face. All retreating. He shuffles out of the room, so slow we don't stop him. The sound of rummaging comes from a back room. When he returns, Mr Powell is holding blossoming sheets of crumpled paper. He gives them all to me. They're yellowed, lined and filled with scrawling handwriting. The ink's deep blue like sailor's tattoos. Or so it seems. When I look closer, I see the writings also fading, leaving half words and blank lines, exactly as they were before they'd been scrawled on. I look at Raffi. He gapes. Shit, he says. Exactly, Mr Powell screeches, laughing, as if it's all a big joke. We sit on the sofa in a row. Me, Mr Powell and Raffi. We spread the colour photos on the coffee table together with the letters, trying to work out what's going on. Mr Powell explains in Bengali. It started happening recently, he says. First, he couldn't remember, he couldn't say whether he had a grown-up niece or a nephew. Then he couldn't remember his mother's name. Then the house he was born in, or the village he grew up in, or the country he'd left to come to England. All of it had faded and retreated from him. When they'd disappeared, it began happening to the things he'd brought over from Bangladesh too. Rafi looks at me. I look at Rafi. To be honest, we don't know what to say. My bro takes Mr Powell's left hand. I take his right. He begins to cry, his thin shoulders shaking with emotion, tears collecting in the crevices of his face. All we can do is gently rub his gnarled, stiffened fingers. We lie and tell him everything's okay. Thank you. finish the second half of the short story. Thank you for staying. Um, so, okay, so I've, I've left my character in, in Janine waiting in an alleyway, so I'll take it from there. I couldn't have stayed at the last witness's house. I'd made my excuses, lies, about people and transport and left, by which time the streets were empty and the only cars remaining in the streets were those that had already been shelled. That level, of, that level of fear is like being in a pressurised container. It's the only way to describe it. A vacuum is created that wins you. <sighs> and then the lid is released. Balance is restored. You're able to breathe again. And then, baff, you're winded once more. What I had not expected, though, was the sense of elation that runs alongside the fear in a prattling endorphin-bolstered rush. Perhaps it's to do with an oxygen manipulation. The bulldozers and tanks comforted each other in the valley below. We're going up there soon, but we shouldn't worry. There are so many of us, and we're together with all the world behind us. And ahead of them, behind me, were bodies in the corners of rooms curled over themselves in front of televisions, soft waiting bodies in collapsible concrete cubes. Maybe we had a lone gunman, possibly two, OK, a handful, some guys who knew how to booby-trap tiles, a couple of fellows who would dab hands with incendiary devices, a god, ours against yours, OK? On the phone, he said, you know they're planning to attack again tonight, as though I didn't know anything. But I had to leave that last house. I couldn't have stayed there, not with those ghosts. They were sucking up all the air. And Judd, you've got to believe me on this one. The little buggers had been seeking me out for weeks. At home, they would come tiptoeing across the stone floor in the half-light of morning. But that, when the first girl had come, I thought she might be bringing me messages from him. But that was not their purpose. They were polite children who used to use speech with care. 
Look, auntie, that first ghost girl had said, twirling in the greyish air, pointing at the part of her head that was no longer there. Look, auntie, half of it is gone. The soldiers blew it away. The ghosts had been more enthusiastic than normal in that last house, pulling at my trousers, willing me to talk to them, peering up at me from under my questionnaire. They chattered irrepressibly, a band of translucent, despairing monkeys on speed. A field worker is essentially a form filler in a flak jacket. My organisation doesn't support the wearing of flak jackets, although our funders agree, argue that we should support this protective attire. My organisation's position is that the wearing of military-style outfits places a distance between us and the witnesses that we interview. I subscribe to my organisation's position and I do not wear a flak jacket. Everyone said I was good at my job, I was thorough and conscientious. Where my skills were lacking was in putting myself, and therefore also my witnesses, at ease. I admit I was a little hung up about being a middle-class Jerusalemite. My bare head was also offensive to many families I visited, and on principle I would never cover it up. As a result to the, of these barriers to communication, as the workshop trainers put it, I frequently adopted an imperious front with my witnesses. I expected them to serve me coffee, to turn on their fans, to offer me their best chair, not to interrupt my questions or to challenge my worth. At the same time, I felt humbled and useless in their presence. I was frequently possessed that the, by the thought that they knew details of my failed sexual relationships and that they therefore understood why I was an unmarried, childless woman in my mid-thirties. To stop them pitying me, I bossed them around. It was better, at least, to be hated. At the last witness's house, I had barked out question six without even thinking. Were the children warned before they were shot? I'd asked Umm Hassan, who had seen the whole incident from the downstairs window. The question had the effect of making the family look towards the door, as though an oddly dressed stranger had just wa walked in. One of Umm Hassan's sons stepped in to disperse the white noise that my question had created. As my mother explained to you over the telephone, the soldiers were telling the children to pull down the wall that had been damaged, to move the bricks, and the children were crying because they were scared of the guns that were being pointed at them. <coughs> I see, I said, scribbling in my form, although the information didn't fit the box. Had a little ghost girl not been at my feet showing me her scratched and bloody palms, I may well have started interviewing, winding up the interview by then. There was a terrible smell of death in that room. <coughs> If you don't know what death smells like, I can explain. It's like lumps of rancid urban snot in your nostrils. It's not the kind of thing that can be dislodged by tissue or a <coughs> change of scene. Once you smelt it, it will always be with you. It may abate before it comes back, but it will always be there. It could recur in the most expensive restaurant in Geneva. Um's um, Hassan's family had been trying to counter it with bleach, air fresheners and disinfectant. The toxically cleansed surfaces of the room were still wet. The air was trying to pass itself off as lily of the valley, but all we could smell was death. They were trying to pick up the bricks and carry them, but the children were small and they were panting. They couldn't get enough breath. <laughs> said Um Hassan, her shoulders moving up and down, her chest contracting like a dog sweating on its side in the sun. Yes, the sun continued. They were breathing like that and the soldiers were aiming their guns at them, watching them run up and down, carrying the bricks and stones, telling them they would be shot if they didn't do it. But Um Hassan was staring at a spot on the wall above the chit veneer sideboard with a gilt decorated tray on it. Her son watched her revisit a scene that was being recalled and replayed for my benefit. But they shot them anyway, she concluded with a shrug. Will the UN give us an extra bag of sugar if our answers are sufficiently precise? asked Um Hassan's son. It's not exactly for the United Nations, but we're hoping to document evidence of war crimes. I'd started and that was enough. Oh, the seduction of that term. After that, I couldn't stop them. The names of the children overwhelmed me. I was writing in a pad now, exasperated by the form's lack of ambition. Who was whose brother? Which girl it was in the red skirt? How, trying to help her three-year-old in the blue? There was no stopping it, and I scribbled and scratched until way past the hour I'd set myself as the absolutely latest time to leave, while the ghost children, orderly now, stepped up and presented themselves as though I was their teacher, or, God forbid, their only mother. He came. He was coming. He had come to get me out of there. The sound of a car travelling too fast over a bumpy surface. The screeching of tyres audible over drones, helicopters and tanks. That was the sound of him coming to get me out of there. He came, he came, he came. 
Who left you here? He shouted, chucking stuff, a child's drawing, a first aid kit, a camera lens off the passenger seat. Had him. His wife was in labour. He should never have left you here, never. He was holding the steering wheel in a melodramatically fierce way. I could see the slubs of a blue vein that ran on either side of his middle knuckle. It was him, in the shirt he'd worn that evening in Ramallah, when he'd twiddled the gardenia stalk in his fingers, round and round, until I pulled it from him and stuck it in his hair, for he was too shy to place it in mine. But you're okay? he asked. You look okay. Quiet. It was quiet, that last line. I'm fine, I insist. I just messed up my exit strategy, that's all suddenly did that. He was looking upwards through a dirt-smeared windscreen as he said this because it was clear that one of the helicopters was taking the same path as us. He accelerated, launching us against the rubble-strewn roads, grating at them with the bare pipe stomach of his fear. That way, I said, although in truth I didn't really know, in darkness the town had transformed itself again. It was more whole now, more resolute. The human diggers had gone, the men, the women, the children who had clawed at rubble with spades and hands. Either side of us were tombs of brick, wire and mattresses. The remaining houses were expressionless in the dark, shuttered up and shut up, sprayed and scrawled with army graffiti that they didn't agree with. He was trying to drive fast, but the roads weren't allowing him to. We kept hitting things and being thrown by them. I heard you were in the area. I, even then, I was not considering what it was that was about to happen to us. We may be safer on foot, he said, but he didn't break or give me a chance to get out. Tank helicopters could be heard, even above the, above the strains and skids of the car, the hell of the helicopter. I still had to know, more than anything, I had to know what happened to her. To who, he shouted loud, angry like a father. The helicopter was hovering right over us, thwacking away as though the sky was made of tyre rubber. To the bride your mother found to replace your unsuitable girlfriend, I was screaming. His face turned up to the hovering weapon, a slam of brakes. Get out, he screamed, get out. Okay, okay, I leant forward to get my bag. My bag? Pulling at the door with the other hand, he grabbed my arm, made my face look at him, look at him. His eyes hard, steady, but talking, talking like I see him now. She was a mistake, okay, the whole thing. She was a big mistake. Now get out, get out. It was at that point that the shelling began. Thank you. Thank you.